Welcome to the Crown Council Mentor of the Month program. It's Steve Anderson, and I am excited to welcome back to our program today one of the Crown Council favorites, Daniel H. Pink. Uh, last time we visited, uh, Dan had just finished his book entitled Drive, which was all about the science of motivation, which has become a favorite among Crown Council dentists all over the world. Today, we're going to talk about timing. Uh, we've all heard that timing is everything. We're all familiar with that, uh, that phrase. Uh, and we're going to talk today about some very specifics about timing, especially as it has to do with dentistry, uh, including when you should schedule your most difficult patients, uh, when you should schedule your continuing education, uh, how does block scheduling impact treatment outcomes, what is the ideal time to present comprehensive care? Uh, does when you interview a prospective employee, uh, if that impacts your hiring decision? And when in your dental career are you most likely to hit rock bottom and what you can do about it? So Dan Pink is gonna show us how timing is a true science. He's done some amazing research in this area. Uh, just to bring everybody up to date, uh, Daniel Pink is a student, he's a practitioner, uh, he is a mentor of motivation and all kinds of other topics. Uh, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa, so this is uh, a smart guy from Northwestern University, also holds a law degree from Yale, uh, spent over two years as a speechwriter in the White House. He is the author of several books, including Drive, which we've already mentioned, and his latest book entitled, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing, which has made several best-selling lists, including the New York Times bestseller list for four months running. Uh, he uses cutting edge research and, uh, and then draws some very fascinating conclusions that we're gonna talk about today. So Dan, welcome back and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Steve, it's good to be back. So talk to us first about what led you to, to research timing. You have, uh, you've researched a lot of topics over the years. This one I found fascinating. So uh, what was the, the entree to this? You know, the, the, I guess the entree was frustration more than anything else. Uh, I was making all kinds of timing decisions in my own life. Uh, everything, I mean, I'm talking to you from my, my office, which is the garage behind my house. So when should I do certain kinds of work? Uh, when, you know, I have a list of things, if I, I have a list of things to do, uh, does it matter when I do, like what sequence I do them in, what should I do first, what should I do last, what should I do early in the day, what should I do late in the day? And um, when should I, when in the day should I exercise? When should I start a project? When should I abandon a project that's not working? And I was making these decisions in a very sloppy, ill-informed way. And that was frustrating to me. Uh, so I started looking around for guidance about how to make those I, the, these decisions in a smarter way. It didn't really exist. And as you mentioned before, the last few books I've written have taken a, a dive into the social science. I said, well, I wonder what kind of research there is on there on this question. And to my amazement, there was a huge amount of research. I mean, I mean, literally, you know, multiples, several multiples in volume than what I expected. And it was spread all over the place in a number of different disciplines. And I found that it was hard work, but I found that if you go wide enough and deep enough into this research, you can begin to piece together the evidence-based ways to make smarter, shrewder decisions about when to do things. As you were saying in your intro, in the course of a day, which is extraordinarily important, but also in the course of all the episodes of our life. Um, and... Um, and, and for me, you know, it is like any kind of medical care, whether it's dentistry or, or any, anything else. I mean, you know, you, you want, if you're a practitioner, you want to make decisions based on evidence. And, and if you're a patient, you want to have a practitioner who is listening to the evidence. You know, there might be folklore about what makes teeth strong, but I don't want a dentist who is operating based on folklore. I want a dentist who knows the latest science and is making decisions based on that. And I think this is a way to import that into, you know, I, I, think, it's, I think there's some lessons in it for dentists, but I also think that there's broader lessons for all of us. Perfect. All right, so if we can start, let's dive into the research yeah. first. 
dentistry obviously is a service industry. It is 100% dependent on the people that are delivering the service. Yeah, Dentists, yeah. hygienists, team members, the whole deal. So let's start with the person. Can you address the things that uh, the research says about uh, times of day and how that impacts personal performance from morning, midday yeah. to night yeah. in terms of what, what we are subject to as individuals in our own personal performance. Sure. Okay. So th let me give you the, the very, very big picture and then we'll, it will zoom in it to the unit of one. The very big picture is this and, and it's, and it's important. And, and, and I think it's one of the biggest lessons of the book. And one of the things that really surprised me, the most important lesson is our cognitive abilities, our brain power does not stay the same throughout the course of a day. Our cognitive abilities change over the course of a day. That's a big deal. I wish someone had told me that earlier. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. very seriously. Right. Because um, if I'm feeling less mentally sharp at different times of the day, I looked at it as a sign of moral weakness, as a sign of you know, being a wimp or whatever, when in fact, like, that's how it is. All right? Right. Our cognitive abilities don't stay the same throughout the day. They vary, uh, the, or, or the, the variance is significant in that the difference between the daily high point and the daily low point can be big. And then the other thing is, is that what we, the best time to do something depends on what it is we're doing. All right. So that's like the framing to think about it in the big picture. Then right. when you get to the more granular levels of it, what you see is, is the following that most of us go through the day in three stages. There is a peak, a trough, a recovery peak trough recovery. Now, about 80% of us go through the day in that order. Peak at earlier in the day, trough midday, um, recovery later in the day. People, the, the one in five of us who are night owls, um, they're different. They're much more complicated. Uh, they go through the day kind of, sort of, recovery trough peak. But the main thing for them is that they hit their peak much later in the day, much later in the day. Now, my hunch, and it's only a hunch, I don't have the evidence of this, is that most dentists, most practitioners are, I, I, I'm engaging the relatively few owls who are in dentistry right. because it is a profession that usually just the nature of it, and even probably, I don't know it that well, but maybe even the training for it often starts in the morning. Like, like you Absolutely. have to, yeah, <clears throat> like, like an owl would be kind of miserable um, in, in, <laughs> right. I, I think that's right. Like I, like I, I don't, again, I don't know this, Steve, I'm just speculating. My right. guess would be that, 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 um, that owls would opt out of that kind of profession. You see a little, there is a little bit of evidence of this in professions like surgery. So mm -hmm. dentistry, depending on what you're doing, right. you know, can be a form of surgery. Um, you could also, um, and also in, in school teachers, uh, which is another thing that starts pretty early. So mm -hmm. let's just say that the typical dentist she works, she, she goes through the day, peak trough recovery. Okay, now, peak, early in the day. The peak is when we're best at analytic work. And, and I think that's, I, that's what the research says. I think the, the most important aspect of this is in the, of the research for your listeners is that, that during the peak, that's when we are most vigilant. Okay, what does it mean <clears throat> to be vigilant? Being vigilant means that you are able to bat away distractions, keep them at bay. All right, so during our peak, which for, for most people is earlier in the day, that's where we're most vigilant. That's where we should be doing work that requires vigilance, where you have to be locked down and focused. Um, now, the trough. The trough is early to the, the, the middle of the day, um, the, sort of the early to mid afternoon. Um, the trough, that, and that's when most of us hit that trough usually about seven, eight hours after, after waking. That's okay. a really bad time for people. I mean, <laughs> the data on this are amazing. And we can get to some of the data on what happens in, in, in hospitals at that period of the day. But <laughs> the evidence is overwhelming. Like, we just don't perform very well during that period. Uh, and I think it's interesting that my dentist's office, and I was telling you before we got on the air, that just ironically, I... Literally, I mean, literally was at the dentist two hours ago. I love it. Um, and my dentist's office, actually, I have a great dentist. And my dentist's office, her dentist's office, the dental office that she works in, she, they shut down the office between like 1230 and 130 or something like that. Right. 
And I, is that a fairly common practice? Yeah, a lot of, lot, lot of dentists do. They take lunch for... Yeah, for yeah. Lunch. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think that ends up actually... That's, that's actually a pretty smart idea from their point of view and from the patient's point of view. Anyway, right. so we got that trough. And then later in the day is when we... Um, later in the day is the recovery period. Recovery period is interesting because our mood goes back up, but we're less vigilant. And the combination of elevated mood and lack of vigilance makes it a good time for things that require a little bit more mental looseness, creative, iterative, brainstorming kinds of things. So uh, forgive this long winded answer, but the gist of it is this peak things that require vigilance and analysis trough stuff that doesn't require much creativity or brain power, administrative kinds of work. Okay. And thanks to our healthcare system, there is a lot of administrative work, unfortunately, in right. dental offices and Recovery is when we're best off doing more kind of creative um, insight kinds of kinds of work. And those, those are the broad, those are, those are the broad, those are the broad principles. Perfect. All right. So here's a, here's a specific question. If you, based on the research, yeah. if you were going to <clears throat> uh, suggest, recommend the best time for a weekly team meeting that would last an hour to 90 minutes max, where we're going to work on the practice. We're going to look at uh, how we can do things better, how we can improve those kind of things. What time of day for the typical person based on peak trough recovery? Okay. Great question. Uh, I'm going to give you two answers to it though. All okay. right. The, the first answer is I would wish, I wish everybody would ask that kind of question. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, really, I, I really do. Cause most people don't ask that question. They just pick a time. They base, we schedule our meetings and things in every organization based on availability, all right? Instead so, of when instead we get investors. Instead, instead of the very question that you are asking, all right? Okay. And so, so my, my first answer is test it. So we don't know. <laughs> like, we don't know. We have to have some humility about what's going to work and what's not going to work. So try it at one time of a day for one week. Try it another time of a day for another week. See if there's any difference, Okay. That said, I'm going to give you a, hypo a, hypo a, hypo a hypothesis about what, would, what might work best. And it's okay. this. If you are talking about, if the meeting requires a little bit of looseness, you're not talking about, um, wow, you know, Mrs. Rodriguez um, has a really serious dental problem and we can't quite figure out what it is and we really need to be locked down and focused on solving it. That's not the kind of meeting you're talking about. You're talking about how to improve the practice more generally. Right. Yeah, I think so. So I would actually have those um, uh, uh, later in the day, okay. um, not early in the day, uh, where people are in a better mood and people are a little bit mentally looser and might be able to see around corners a little bit better and might be able to, um, you know, be actually in some ways less vigilant. And because because vigilance sometimes gets us vigilance is very good in many kinds of things, but sometimes vigilance is like, well, no, that's a bad idea because we've never done it that way. Right. And so the vigilance keeps out the creativity. So my guess would be later, later in the, um, later in the afternoon. And um, I think there's probably something to be said for doing it um, where possible, you know, offsite or, okay. um, you know, we're to change the scenery too. I would experiment. I would experiment with that. So uh, root canals in the morning uh -huh. where, Detail and vigilance and focus is. I required. want my endodontist to be vigilant, right? <laughs> right. I'm serious. Right. And, and, and the meeting on how to market the practice in the afternoon. Boom. That's okay. it right so there. Creativity uh, in the well, afternoon. Late, late afternoon. Late afternoon. Not Got during it. the trough period, but late afternoon. No, but yeah, later, later late in after, the day. Late afternoon and early, late afternoon and early in the day. But absolutely. If I had a root canal, unfortunately, I've never had a root canal. Um, um, although I actually. I mean, no joke. I was actually at the endodontist this week too. It's just it's crazy this, this week. Um, we can share all of my dental history with you here. It's all here. here. It's all, yeah, all an open place. book or an I open mouth it. at least. Um, the um, yeah. So if I had a root canal, if that's so why as a patient, um, there is no way on God's green earth I would schedule a root canal for myself or anybody I cared about in the afternoon, period. All right, so will you touch on the research yeah. and what you found in yeah. healthcare, medical yeah. terms, because this was uh, not unexpected and it was jaw-dropping. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. The, the numbers are pretty compelling and 
there's some, there's some really, really excellent research. And the research is looking at, uh, most of it is looking at very, very large data sets from multiple hospitals. So it isn't, so, and, and to me, when you do that, you, you end up, because of the size of the, the data set and the breadth of the different kinds of hospitals, you're seeing something that isn't isolated because, oh, well, this hospital treats, it has mainly a geriatric patients and that's really what's driving it rather than these other kinds of effects. So you end up smoothing out a lot of those kinds of things. But the gist of it is this. I'll give you, uh, let's, let's, uh, so let's talk about something relevant to uh, 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 endodontic, endodontist practice, which is uh, anesthesia. Um, okay. anesthesia. Anesthesia errors. Four times more likely at 3 p.m. than at 9 a.m. 4x difference. Uh, if you look at hand washing, I know. If you look at hand washing in hospitals, this is why, again, I'm going to reveal the whole pink family. Dental history. <laughs> My daughter, who is coming home from college this summer, is going to have her wisdom teeth taken out. She's 19 years old. And believe me, her appointment, because she's going to have general anesthesia for that, for those wisdom teeth extraction, yeah. eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and so anesthesia, hand washing in hospitals, huge decline in the afternoons. Really? Uh, it, huge. Um, some really, really good research on that from Katie Milkman at Penn and Brad Stats at U University of North Carolina. If you look at, okay, so there's a, uh, if you look at colonoscopies, colonoscopies, doctors find half as many polyps in afternoon exams as they do in morning exams for the exact same population. Yeah. Because so of just not as vigilant in the afternoon in terms of looking boom. at all this stuff. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so I think that for, so when you talk about root canals, we're talking about things that require, you know, pretty significant vigilance. Um, you want to get those done uh, in, in the morning. And so, you, you know, you, you mentioned earlier this, this idea of block scheduling, where you put your most difficult and important procedures first. I think that's generally a good, a, generally a good move in most dental practices. Data supports and, that. And, and again, you know, again, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of joking about, I'm not joking, but I mean, we're sort of making light of the decisions I'm making in my own dental care, but, but, I'm, but, but, but truly like now, like I am absolutely comfortable going in for, you know, a six month routine cleaning and checkup in the afternoon. I have no, I have no, I have no problem with that. <clears throat> not as no much problem. vigilance required there. I have no, absolutely no problem with that. And the people who are doing this are, are I, I have a full faith in my dental office and the people who are doing it are professionals and cleaning my teeth doesn't require root canal level vigilance all right however for other kinds of things so for i mean again i'm going to i'm going to reveal everything here so <laughs> i have um uh yeah, in my old age steve my teeth have started to move a little bit in ways right. that were kind of unexpected so i am going to have in, i'm going to get invisalign sweet love okay. it so um and um but my first appointment for invisalign uh to so, so get the initial trays and everything like that is I scheduled it for 8.30, 8.20 in the morning um, because that, because I want my doctor who, my, my dentist who's outstanding to be super vigilant and locked in on that. I know it's the beginning of this long process. So I want to make sure that I'm vigilant and paying attention to the instructions so that I can comply. Um, whereas I had the, I'm going to reveal everything here. Where, whereas, whereas I had the initial appointment to have the, the molds, or I think the impressions, the, yeah. the impressions made so that they could send them off where it's basically just, Hey, put some foam in here. And right. like I had that done in the afternoon. Whatever. So I wouldn't sacrifice my good work time for, for that, but I'm willing to sacrifice my good work time for the vigilance of an expensive, um, uh, you know, probably year long process to move my teeth in different positions because in my old age, they've moved out of line. So. All right, so <clears throat> along with that, okay, so let's, that's on the, the procedure side. Can yeah. we take a step back and let's talk about decision-making? Okay, okay so great. Let's take uh, Dan Pink's going in to talk about his Invisalign case. To see, this is basically a full mouth procedure, which, you know, maybe it's Invisalign, maybe it's veneers, maybe, but, but you're yeah. gonna make a significant financial decision regarding yeah. your health care. What time of day am I as a consumer 
most likely to make a, <clears throat> a favorable decision or the right decision. The right decision. Okay, so when you say <laughs> favorable to the patient. Um, right. Yeah, so um, uh, there's some really good research on this and I'll give, you the general, I'll give you the general principle. What it seems is that, well, let me take two steps back and talk about decision-making in general because that'll, that'll get us here. When we make decisions, when human beings make decisions, we usually, and, and especially when we're confronted with a decision, okay? Wow, look at this. Do you, looks like you might want, veneers might be good for you. Do you want veneers? Wow, you have like a lot of movement over the last few years here. What's got, do you want invisible, okay? So when you're confronted with a decision, when we make decisions that we're confronted with, we usually come to that encounter with a default decision in our back pocket. And the default decision is generally no. All right, for anything. So forget about dental care. Let's say you Court, go to course of least resistance is no. Exactly. You don't have to do anything. Okay. Bingo. So like, like if you go to ask your boss, you know, forget about dentistry. You're, you're working for the Acme widget company in their corporate headquarters. And you go to ask your boss for a raise. Her default decision is going to be no. no. Right? You're, right. Selling, um, you're selling medical devices to hospitals. And their default decision is going to be no. Right? Status so, quo. Bingo. So when are people likely to overcome the default in their decision making? And it looks, based on the research, it looks like they're somewhat more likely to overcome the default. That is to push back against the default decision, which is, in, is almost always no or status quo, as you're saying, early in the day and immediately after breaks. Early in the day and immediately after breaks. Okay. Um, that's when people seem to be more likely to overcome the default. How and can I, <clears> so on just on like just judicial decision-making and so forth that gives us clues about that. So, so let's address the immediately after a break. What does a, let's look at a patient situation. What does a break look like? Is this when somebody's out of their regular routine, they're not doing business as usual. They've had their mind on something else where they've gotten a mental. So characterize a break for me. Um, it's okay. So a break is, is, is typically a moment where, or, or a, 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 a block of time, not enormous, like it literally can be like five, six, 10 minutes where they are fully detached from their day to day. So a break isn't, I'm sitting in the, uh, waiting room of the dental office, uh, responding to work email. It gotcha. is, it's something like, um, like, um, uh, I, I got give you an, again, example from my own life. So, so my dentist is their dental office and my, my wife goes to this dental practice too, is, um, it's walking distance from my house. It's about a mile away. Um, and so if I, so that walk to the dentist's office, if I'm not like, like if I'm <clears> taking a walk to the dentist's office, that's pretty break. much a break. If I'm on a, right. if I'm like on a phone call while I'm walking, that's not a break. So that kind of gotcha. thing. And that's hard for, from the, from the, from the dental office's point of view, it's very hard to know when your patient is going to have had a break, you know. Um, but uh, there, there is some room here to create some space in that dental appointment sure. where, Absolutely. where they get a break. Absolutely. From Absolutely. From right. Everything that's going on. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go back to timing for just a minute as it has to do with personal performance. Dentistry is a very physically demanding profession. Yeah, yeah. Moving yeah. all day, yeah, you know, yeah, people do yeah, things. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, physical exercise is a key component of being able to perform sure. long term. Sure. So you did some fascinating research on exercise and the timing. Mm -hmm. of exercise and when is the best to do certain things and talk to us about that quickly. Yeah. So, so the, the, uh, when it comes to exercise and, and timing, it really depends on what your goals are. So it's, it looks like morning exercise is best for people if they're interested in losing weight. Although there's a lot of research lately showing exercise is less powerful for weight loss than we might think. Um, it's um, uh, um, better for morning exercise seems better for habit formation just because if you exercise later in the day, you might get busy and have it, you know, not have knocked away. And then also the other thing is that exercise, and this could be very important for, for dental practice, uh, exercise gives people, um, aerobic exercise gives people a pretty significant mood boost. And that mood boost lasts a, a decent amount of time. 
And so if, yeah. And so if you exercise late in the day, you could end up, you're going to get that, that mood boost is going to be shortened because you're going to be sleeping during some of it. Okay. That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the case for morning exercise. You'll have happy sleep if you exercise in the afternoon. <laughs> the case for afternoon exercise is a little bit different. <clears throat> afternoon exercise, you're more likely to avoid injury. Afternoon exercise, uh, because again, uh, changes in body temperature, which actually ends up being a much more important aspect of our physiology than I ever would have imagined. So, so changes in body temperature, our body temperature peaks around, you know, late afternoon and early evening. So, um, so, cause you're, so you're literally more warmed up. You're less likely to injure yourself to, uh, people report uh, enjoying exercise more at that time of day, finding it less effortful and that can actually aid in compliance. And then uh, performance is better to the extent. So especially for, so at that time of day, basically between late afternoon and early evening, uh, lung function is higher, hand-eye coordination is greater, uh, speed is greater. Uh, and that's something I need a lot of help with is speed. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and so it really depends on, it really depends on your, it really depends on your own goals and your own personal preferences. For me, um, the, uh, I, I find morning exercise really, really effortful. I, I never enjoy it. Where when I exercise later in the day or in the early evening, I, I actually enjoy it more. And when I enjoy, you know, if you enjoy it, you're more likely to, you're more likely to do it. Love it. Uh, let's switch gears to the education front. Dentistry is a profession that requires a tremendous amount of continual, continuous education. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. Dentist team members go to a lot of courses. Yeah. Uh, that are, you know, typically classroom kind of settings uh, that are not always structured to be uh, in the timing aspect, uh, probably violate a lot of the rules that yeah. your research has found. So uh, we all go to education, suggestions you have based on your research. If I'm going to a two-day educational course, what can I do to manage the timing so that I get the most out of that course, knowing why you've just shared about peak trough and recovery. Yeah. Um, again, I mean, I think it, go it goes back to depends on the kind of training that you're, you're, you're well, if it's pure tra training, the very nature of the word training suggests a certain amount of vigilance. It's like, mm -hmm. how do I understand this set of procedures and how do I do them in a way that is, 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 is correct. Uh, I think that for in general, for most people, those are, better done early in the day rather than late in the day. Um, but I also think that one of the things that I don't think goes on enough is, is breaks. Uh, we know a lot more about the science of breaks and we should be taking in general four breaks and we should be taking certain kinds of breaks. And so the idea of sitting in a classroom for three hours consecutive is, is just not a good idea. Human beings just don't learn very effectively that way. Uh, you're better off uh, and, 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 and I can understand that, uh, you know, as a, as a teacher saying, oh man, wait, uh, yeah, I got a lot of stuff to cover. So let's go for three let's hours go. rather than have some schmo say to me, you know what, you're better off doing 45 minutes and a 15 minute break, 45 minutes and a 15 minute break. 40, oh my God, that's three fifteen. minutes. I'm sacrificing 45 minutes total of this. You're crazy. And <laughs> right. that's what I used to think. But I actually, those breaks actually are much more important to learning then we, um, those, those breaks are much more important to learning than we think. So even if you were, and also, uh, and also, and also, I mean, truly getting a full night's sleep before and after, um, is incredibly important in learning. I mean, staying out all night drinking is not a good idea if you're going to a CE course. Uh, you know, it depends on what the course is on. If the course is on drinking, then it's probably a good idea. Um, Got it. So there is, um, so there is some, there is some scientific basis in the importance of breaks. Real quick, talk to me about napping. Um, you know, again, I'm not sure this is ideal for all dental practices, but the science of, on naps is, is pretty persuasive. Naps are pretty darn good for us. Uh, uh, naps are, uh, I mean, we're, you and I are talking during the week that the Stanley Cup finals are being played and featuring a team from my adopted hometown of Washington, D.C. And so, I, so, you know, I'll use this analogy. Naps are Zambonis for our brains. So that, you know, you get all of this, these nicks and scuffs on your mental ice during the course of a day. 
And a nap can come out and just kind of smooth it all out. But the best naps are remarkably short, really between 10 to 20 minutes long. If you nap longer than that, you begin to develop what's called sleep inertia, which is just that groggy, boggy feeling that you get. So, uh, so super short naps, 10 to 20 minutes long, uh, can be extremely, uh, ex extremely effective. And so if you have you know, a particularly <clears throat> arduous day, uh, I, I don't think it's a bad idea for one of your team members to go into a dark room with a couch and um, you know, try to take a 15 minute nap. Um, that might actually improve their performance when they wake up. Or, or even would your research suggest that <clears throat> if I've got, if I'm a dentist and I'm going in to do a you know, relatively complicated procedure in the afternoon, mm -hmm. just because of that, taking a break beforehand will somewhat improve my performance versus just motoring through it. Yeah, generally. And, and what I would do is, um, I mean, they're different, you know, the kind of breaks that we're talking about what we've been talking about are, are really uh, uh, you know, restorative breaks. How can you replenish your mental energy and your alertness? Uh, there's another kind of break that we can think of as a vigilance break. And so if you are, uh, so if you're going into an important procedure in the afternoon, uh, you know, there's a, well, I mean, just in general, but afternoons in particular, there's a pile of evidence showing that having a checklist is enormously important. Um, that if you're doing anything complicated uh, in medically, that having like, you know, before you begin the procedure and you're doing it with a team, and, and I write about this a little bit when I went to the University of Michigan uh, uh, hospital uh, to stand in on some surgeries, um, that these literally be, the team before they even began the surgery took liter a literal step back from the table, had a timeout and and went through a checklist and that kind of vigilance, like I would, that, that to me is, is, um, is, is even more important than taking, uh, more important than taking a, a short break. Let's talk about the, um, uh, the extent of a career. When is the average person most likely to hit the bottom point of the trough <laughs> in their career, right? Because from, from your research, it sounds like careers and kind of life in general follows this same general pattern of... Sort of. I mean, there, there are patterns. There are, there are patterns. And when the most prominent pattern over the course of a lifetime is, is what's called a, a U-shaped curve of well-being, where in our 20s and 30s, we're generally pretty happy. Uh, our well-being goes down in our 40s. Uh, in our 50s, it generally hits the bottom. It's not a midlife crisis. The bottom doesn't fall out, but it's, a, <laughs> it, it, it's sort of a, a U-shaped curve. And then after our mid-50s or so, it begins to, it begins to tick back up. And, and the, the interesting thing about this particular pattern, this U-shaped curve of well-being, is how remarkably consistent it is. Uh, so there's very little difference between men and women in that curve. Uh, there, and, there, and also, I think most tellingly, there's, there's very little difference in uh, nationalities. Uh, this, mm. that, this curve has been detected in something like 70-something countries. So if I were to show you the, the, the curve of well-being for the United States, and then or if I were to show you a curve of well-being and say, here's one curve of well-being, here's another one, here's another one, and say, one of these is from the United States, one of these is from Denmark, mm. and one of these is from the United Arab Emirates, you would be hard pressed to tell me which was which. So give us the why behind that. Why, I don't do, know. why do you shape curves? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't think we know. All we know is, is, all we know is this correlation. I mean, I think that we can, we can speculate. I don't know if the speculation is right. Um, I think that when we, um, uh, I, I think it, when you get to that point, this is pure speculation. I think that when you get to that point in life, that middle period in life, um, some harsh realities begin to settle in. So let's say that you're working at a company and you know you turn out, oh my gosh, only one person gets to be CEO and it's not gonna be me. Um, I think that in our 20s, we envision, well, of course I'm gonna become CEO of this company. Right. Like, why? of course. Uh, and so in your, you know, early on, you're like irrationally exuberant and then you, you deal, you reckon with all of that. Um, you know, you have, um, you might start a marriage in your 20s uh, or 30s, being very optimistic about that, and then it crumbles. 
and you know um, that brings down your well-being. Uh, people face dual pressures sometimes of raising kids and dealing with aging parents. That's the period of life where it does that. Um, but I think what's interesting about that is that you end up ticking back up. Um, that is, when you get a little bit older, I think what people do is they have um, they have this irrational exuberance early, perhaps. And again, I just want to emphasize how much I'm speculating here. Right. The, <clears throat> the irrational exuberance early. And then afterwards, you have a kind of a recalibration. You say, well, my life is pretty good. Like I I've done a pretty good job at work and I'm making a contribution. And the person who did become CEO, I mean, he's actually miserable and he just got fired. And um, I got a nice family and um, I'm in pretty good, you know, and people just, you know, think about the context a little bit more. There's a, a move, interesting, again, speculative there, you know, we talk about the wisdom of, that comes with age. And I, I actually think there's some evidence of that, of, mm -hmm that when you get older, you become a lot of evidence that you become a little bit more emotionally intelligent, a little bit more empathic, um, and a little bit more able to understand the context of situations rather than the explicit text. And so when you can put things into context, you're more emotionally intelligent and you're more empathetic with others, and that probably will tr trigger at least some self-compassion as well, you actually recalibrate your views of your own life. So takeaway here is if you're in your late 40s, early 50s. You're screwed. No. It ain't going to get much worse. You right. all, it's only going to get better. <laughs> Listen, the, 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 exact rock, the exact bottom in some of the best research, um, this is research from Angus Beaton, at, who's a Nobelist at Princeton, yeah. showed that the, the, the bottom point for U.S. Ma males in the United States the age at which the statistical bottom for men in the United States is 52.9 years. To be exact. Yeah, and I am, and I am 53. So I am, I am living at that. You're at that on your bottom. way back up, brother. Bingo, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You started out uh, sharing that you, you went into this research because of personal questions about am I yeah, doing, yeah. doing the right yeah. things at the right time and the whole deal. So, now on the other end, you've done the research, you've written the book. For you, what have been the biggest takeaways from from this work? I mean, I think you've seen some of it in that I'm 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 actually consciously like I would never I would have made any kind of medical appointment based on my own availability, right? And now I'm thinking, or, or you know, or advised like my 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 kids or whatever. And now I'm much more intentional about about that. So you saw, you know, I've seen that. Uh, when it comes to my own work, uh, I've changed my own work schedule so that uh, so I'm a writer and writing is, to my mind, writing requires an enormous amount of vigilance. You have to lock down, not be distracted, make these words march in formation. And um, I do my best work in my analytic work better in the morning than in the afternoon. So when I'm writing a big project, you know, book or a long article, um, I don't even bring my phone into the office in the morning, in those mornings. Uh, I don't answer my email. I just focus right. on that one task. It's sort of like a dentist. It's like, I'm gonna Absolutely. take, I'm, it's block scheduling for writers. Seriously, I mean, I never thought of it that way, but it's block, uh, like what's, what's, what's my most important complicated procedure? Oh, I have to write 800 words in this chapter. Well, I'm doing that before I do anything else. And, and you know, closing my email and literally not even bringing my phone with me into the, not even bring my phone into the office and, and, and having like a, a, a quota, like a word count. Um, and just do that day after 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 day. And then I do my, my, when I'm on the, when I'm on the um, asking questions end of interviews, I tend to do those in the latish afternoon um, because the interviews can be a little bit more freewheeling. Now you don't always have that kind of luxury Right. You don't always have that kind of luxury. So for this interview here, which we're doing at two in the afternoon, my time, I actually, to make sure that I was focused here, I actually took a walk around the block and got a cup of coffee before doing this interview. Because I know this you is didn't, not You my, didn't take a nap before this we did this? Not, this is not my, <laughs> is, oh, I know that I should have maybe. This is not my ideal time of right. day. And so, but I like, you know, I had an obligation. And because of my own schedule, like this is the one time we could do it. 
So, <laughs> but, but I have an obligation to your listeners to make sense, right? And yeah. so how do you do that? You take even a, you know, a micro break, a small micro break can be- uh, You got to take a break in the dental chair today. So it wasn't half bad. It wasn't that much of a break. <laughs> So biggest, what would you say is when, when someone gets done reading the book and looking at all the research that took you countless hours to put together, what is the biggest thing that you want them to walk away with? Uh, they should be intentional about their Tommy decisions and we're not. Um, so, um, so we have things to do and we just kind of do them whenever we feel like doing them in the day and that's the wrong way to do it. Um, we, we think that it doesn't matter what time of day we do certain kinds of work. It matters. It matters a heck of a lot. And so you need to be intentional about doing the right work at the right time. And you see this, I mean, you mentioned something about meetings before. I mean, you see, if you think about, let's get outside of dental care and talk about just the mass economy out there. If you think about how people, how, how much time Americans spend, white collar working Americans spend in meetings, it's unbelievable. And yet, the only criterion we use when we schedule meetings in companies is availability. Right. Who has a spot in their schedule and is conference room 3C open? We don't, we're not intentional about it. We don't say, hmm, what kind of people are going to be at this meeting? Are there going to be people who are better in the morning? Are there going to be people who are better later, later in the day? Do we have a bunch of larks in our office? Do we have a bunch of owls in our office? What kind of meeting is this? Is this a meeting where we need people to be locked down and focused and vigilant? Or is this a meeting that's purely, or is a meeting where we need to actually be a little bit more freewheeling and brainstorm? Or is this meeting just administrative? Is it about our travel voucher policy? We don't ask any of those questions. We're totally unintentional about it. We just say who's available and is conference room 14L open? <clears throat> and, and if we're just intentional about these kinds of things from when we schedule meetings to when we schedule our medical appointments to when we sit down to do our most important work to when we answer our email, what we're going to see is we're going to see improvements in performance, period. And, when there, and we should also emphasize the fact that performance and mood are often tied together. So when you feel better, you perform better. When you perform better, you feel better. So if you can actually time your work a little bit so that you're in the right mood for the task and you perform better, that's going to enhance your mood, which is going to enhance your performance, which is going to enhance your mood, which is going to enhance your performance. And you get the, the, uh, something that you get that virtuous circle rather than the vicious downward spiral that we often get. Be intentional. Indeed. So and again, floss. Um, and floss. And floss. <laughs> so again, uh, the title of the book is when the scientific secrets of perfect timing Great piece of work, Dan. You know that you are one of my favorite people. Well, well, thank you. you. I appreciate that. Is that uh, I have a, a very exclusive list of required reading uh, for our dentists. I keep that list updated on a regular basis. Drive is well, on thanks. that list. Thank you. And when has most recently been placed. Oh, wow. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Great I stuff. I love your research. Thank you. And uh, love the way you communicate. Thanks Thank for you. sharing with us today and thanks for uh, giving us some good things that will make our lives better and the lives of uh, countless patients as well. And good luck on the Invisalign. We're going to do an after interview. <laughs> Beautiful straight teeth uh -huh. when you get done. All right. All right. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on the show, Steve. Appreciate it.